was only six when he found his calling. I started folding over typing paper, stapling it together, drawing comic books. And the path he chose wasn't easy. And I would come over and he'd tell me how terrible my work was. That stuff is okay. I mean, that stuff looks like a guy who's just breaking into comics, like an artist's first paying gig. It reached the point where Beyond just berating me and telling me to move back to Vermont because I was hopeless. But he would go on to become one of the greatest names in comic book history. First time I saw his work, I said, this is a big new talent emerging. You felt like you were getting his blood, sweat, and tears on the page. And I've never read any graphic novels that are as intense as his. He is one of the few creators who comes into a medium and really makes it look at itself in a different light. He's his own little legend. What goes on in his brain is something so crazy, beautiful, sexy, violent, cool, genius. Icons presents the one and only Frank Miller. In 1963, a six-year-old boy named Frank Miller is introduced to a millionaire playboy named Bruce Wayne by DC Comics. I picked it up in a department store. It was back when they had sold comic books in department stores. I picked it up and I, and I just opened it and I just felt in. And I like to say that even though it cost 25 cents, I bought it. This chance meeting marks the beginning of what will be a lifelong passion. I started folding over typing paper stapling it together and drawing comic books. I fell in love with crime fiction. Everything from Mickey Spillane to Dashiell Hammett to Remy Chandler. I kept drawing comics. Then I moved to New York to try to break in. Frank's first job in New York has a bit too much in common with the crime novels he enjoyed so much as a kid. I was a carpenter. I mean, I, I'm a, sort of a carpenter. I helped hang doors and things in a loft that turned out to be run by a by a coke dealer. <laughs> so yeah, I had to run away from mafia guns at one point. <laughs> it's not long until the aspiring comic book creator meets up with the legendary Neil Adams. Neil Adams was an artist who came to comics in the late 60s and really brought a whole new school of art to superhero comic books, a very literal realism. The characters he drew looked real. I mean, as real as we'd ever seen them. And they weren't stylized. Neil was my mentor. I mean, he was very generous with his time. I simply called him up and asked him if I could show him my pictures. And he had me over to his studio. He was running a big shop then that did advertising work. I never really worked there, but he would always take my phone call and I would come over and he'd tell me how terrible my work was. It reached the point where Beyond just berating me and telling me to move back to Vermont because I was hopeless, he'd pull out tracing paper and start correcting me. But Frank keeps trying, and one day, his efforts pay off. And then one day I came in, and he just picked up the phone to Gold Key Comics and, and said, I got somebody for you. And he got me my first job. It was Twilight Zone Comics. And I spent a week drawing every page. Usually that's something you do within a day. It was my first professional job, and I took forever on it. It was three pages long, and I took three weeks to draw it. Um, but it's, it's, it's a, it was a start. That stuff is OK. I mean, that stuff looks like a guy who's just breaking into comics, you know? It looks like an artist's first paying gig. Hindsight being 2020, you can see the flashes of Frank Miller there. You can see what the potential, what he could become. Soon, other doors are open. Frank Miller had done a couple issues of Spectacular Spider-Man, which had featured Daredevil in them. Yeah, Daredevil was mine. I liked Daredevil because I was always doing characters that were flawed. And Daredevil had probably the biggest handicap of all. He was blind. It became clear that, that was what he wanted to do. And so they gave him a shot at doing Daredevil. Marvel puts Frank Miller to work on Daredevil. And 
and what he does with the red suited crime fighter will send shockwaves throughout the comic book universe. In May 1979, Frank Miller begins what will become a legendary run on Marvel Comics' Daredevil. I became the pencil artist on Marvel's Daredevil, working with writer Roger McKenzie and my collaborator Klaus Jensen, who inked it, and eventually I took over writing it. He really reinvented Daredevil. The thing that I think made Frank's run on Daredevil and Elektra so special was that Frank is a New Yorker, he lives in New York, and he knows the city inside and out so he was able to bring that kind of gritty hell's kitchen from first-hand experience to the daredevil electro universe he made him a much darker character wrote his own material he drew it and he had a very earthy hard edge style to both his writing and to his artwork the first time i saw his work i said this is a big new talent emerging in Daredevil, issue 168, he introduces the world to Elektra. Daredevil had a long run of girlfriends, but I thought, how about one that could kick his butt? And also, how about her being a bad guy? Which is what everybody gets wrong about Elektra. They try to make her nice. They try to make her good. She's not good. She's very, very bad. She just feels bad about being bad. I thought Elektra was a wonderful character, and he did her beautifully, and there hadn't been a character like Elektra before. She was the first female anti-hero. Sometimes she would act with compassion, sometimes she was a cold-blooded killer. It's what superhero romance should be. Frank said it himself, their romances should be bigger than life, just like their adventures are. But Frank doesn't intend for Elektra to be around long term. It was inevitable. I was plotting as I went, but it became very obvious that she had to go. There was no other way to take it. I mean, she wasn't going to end up making Bob Bob up a mat. So I went to editor-in-chief Jim Shooter, just popped into his office and said, Jim, I, I really am, um, I think I'm going to have to kill Electra. And he sighed. And he looked like he had a headache. And he said, tell me a story, Frank. And I told him my story. And he said, great, do it. The death of Electra is like a, for everyone of my generation, it's a total benchmark for comics in general. You read it, and you were just like, oh my god, I can't believe that, that he did this. Here's Daredevil, he's a blind superhero. He loses Electra, a woman he loves, who dies in his arms. That's in a comic book. Back then, this kind of stuff just didn't happen. And Frank Miller was a storyteller and a, an artist who was willing to make these sort of bold moves and say, look, I'm writing good stories. I'm not just trying to to show comics to kids. I'm trying to make good stories. In July 1983, Frank Miller leaves Marvel to work on an original creation, once again doing his own writing and penciling. After Daredevil, Frank Miller went over to DC Comics and scored, at the time, a very unique deal for a creator-owned book. Ronin was something he created that he came up with. It was kind of a sci-fi, samurai, urban decay story that took a lot of elements and a lot of genres and kind of crammed them all together. Ronin is an extremely strange project. I'm amazed it was ever greenlighted, where it takes place in the future. That stuff was so strange back then. You never saw anything like that. Well, Ronin was a joy to do. As much as I loved doing Daredevil, Ronin was scarier to work on, much more challenging, much more ambitious. I just learned a ton. I love that book, because it was me with reckless abandon. Absorbing the Japanese and the French, it was a wild mix, and it was a reckless piece of work, but I still love it. Miller hires an artist named Lynn Varley to be the inker for Ronin, marking the start of what will be a long-standing professional relationship, and more. Meanwhile, Frank's popularity continues to grow, and he gets bigger and better offers. DC Comics had been on me to do Batman for a long time, and I'd always felt too intimidated by it. I, I mean, I just felt like the character was too big for me. I, I didn't I didn't really have what it took for it. And then, you know, one day I was just thinking about it. All of a sudden, I realized that, yeah, I was about to turn 30. And Batman was permanently 29. And I was going to be damned if I was older than Batman. So I started concocting this story where he was in his 50s and coming out of retirement and with a much harder edge. DC went with just about every single thing I proposed. Fate once again brings together Frank Miller and the Dark Knight. What happens next will be the stuff of legends. In 
In March 1986, DC Comics releases the first issue of Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. The arrival of this unique new Batman tale is groundbreaking. But when Frank came along, he went back and he'd taken what was kind of primary about Batman, this urban warrior, and dealt with the idea that he was disillusioned, he was older, he had kind of given up the fight. And that really is a classic mythological story of the old warrior comes back for one last hurrah against uh, the forces of evil. What people would have expected from Frank would be to basically do Daredevil with a cape. He didn't get that. He wasn't the same lean, lanky, athletic figure that Daredevil was. He had instead changed Batman into this big, hulking brute of a character. He set a new tone for Batman. What Frank Miller did was delve into the psyche of somebody who would be so deeply disturbed as to put on a costume and do these things, and how really inhuman that psyche is. The Dark Knight series that Frank Miller did is one of the core books that said, you know what? The comic book medium is for people of all ages, and I can write an adult, mature storyline. Dark Knight Returns. It was another one of those times where life just felt explosive because the work was just flying at me. And Lynn Varley plays an increasingly large role in her partnership with Frank. Not only is she the colorist for The Dark Knight Returns, but she also helps with the dialogue. Oh, she's great. Those two are probably on a lot of levels a match made in heaven. What she did on Dark Knight was, at the time, revolutionary. You've never seen coloring like that. They're one of the best artist colorists collaborations that we've seen in comics. Eventually, Frank Miller and Lynn Varley become husband and wife. Soon after the release of The Dark Knight Returns, Hollywood comes knocking on Frank's door. Well, he, actually what happened was, this is gonna sound strange, but I, I moved from New York to Los Angeles to find out what California was like. I really didn't have any designs on movie work at all. And then one morning the phone rang, and it was the producer of Robocop asking me if, if I'd be up for writing the sequel. And I, I loved the movie, and I thought, yeah, I can work in movies. And I just fell into that. And for the next couple of years, I was completely wrapped up. But there are some harsh lessons to be learned in Tinseltown. Well, Robocop 2 was the more intense of the two for me because that, I was on the set every day and watched the whole process. Robocop 3, I was a little more distant because I, I didn't go to the set or anything. In both cases, I learned the same lesson, though. Don't be the writer. The director's got the power. The screenplay is a fire hydrant. There's a row of dogs around the block waiting for it. <laughs> Eventually, Miller decides he's had enough. But when I just decided I couldn't handle it anymore and went away. After leaving the movie scene, he dives into a brand new original project with Dark Horse Comics. I'd gone through the longest period of my life not drawing, which was two years. So I sat down in my new home in Hollywood. I just decided, I just sat at my drawing board. I decided I was going to start drawing again, and I was going to draw exactly what I want. Damn Hollywood. And I started Sin City. You felt like you were getting Frank at his most committed as a creator. I mean, you felt like you were getting his blood, sweat, and tears on the page. And I draw this comic book that's everything I always wanted to draw. First three priorities were tough guys in the trench coats, beautiful women, and vintage cars. Well, Sin City is a, a marvelous achievement in terms of sequential art. These are noir comics where light and shadow and toads of gray are what communicate the emotion rather than colors. It's in City. Here's somebody who just wanted to tell these great kick-ass crime stories and told them in a way that nobody else could imagine or envision them. There's a hard edge to them. There's a brutality to them. There's also a really rough beauty and an elegance to them. Sin City has been viewed as really one of the pinnacles of Frank Miller's art achievements and, and storytelling abilities. And I went on for 12 years to draw my Sin City, and I'm absolutely in love with it. The Sin City series of comic books is another stunning success for Miller, 
Ironically, the work that best represents his true passion will bring him back to an industry he thought he was done with. I've got to go fly him because it's a good yeah, yeah. I take his weapons away from him. Yeah. After leaving the film industry, Frank Miller works on some of his most memorable books. Graphic novels such as Hard Boiled and 300 are all critical successes. But it's Sin City that captures the attention of director Robert Rodriguez, the man behind Once Upon a Time in Mexico and Desperado. Robert Rodriguez hunted me down like a dog. I don't want to make Robert Rodriguez the Sin City. I want to make Frank Miller Sin City because I love that material so much. And it was so good the way it was, I thought this would be a great movie, as is on screen. When he first approached me, I was just awful. I really didn't want my baby loose. Robert called me up and said, fly to Austin, we'll shoot a test, and we'll see if we want to do this thing or not. And I said, sure. And I showed up in Austin, and there was Josh Hartnett standing with Robert's crew. And there was Marley Shelton. Marley Shelton came over and asked me a question about a character, and I just, the hook was in my mouth. Robert had pulled off, and I never looked back. On the other set, let's line it up, please. Sin City, the movie, begins filming in March 2004. But Robert's idea was to make it an anthology. It has a short story and three of the novels incorporated, about 40 minutes each. Sin City, the graphic novel, That Yellow Bastard, and The Big Fat Kill. You move from one to the other, and you really get a sense that, that it's a single world. An incredible all-star cast is put together to bring the citizens of Sin City to the silver screen. As we approached people, some of them responded just to the chance to work with Robert. Some responded to the material. I'll never forget the afternoon that Robert and I went to Bruce Willis's house. At this point, we had what was called the test. We put it on Bruce's big screen. Bruce sat on a bare mattress and watched it. We kind of stood up and said, those are the words from the book? And Robert said, yeah. I'm in. And then the cast is beyond, you know, from Mickey Rourke to Benicio Del Toro to Clive Owen to Rosario Dawson, Jamie King, Brittany Murphy, Elijah Wood, Josh Hartnett. I mean, the cast is insane. Shelly is a waitress from the section of Sin City called Old Town. Shelly's a bit of a broad, and she's a broad whose heart is torn She's the sad waitress with the heart of gold. It was only because I felt sorry for her. I'll call you later. No, don't go! I play Nancy Callahan, and um, I think she was inspired by Frank Miller's real-life niece. Of course, in Frank's world, I'm a stripper, um, but... <laughs> It, it just came together. It was almost like everybody wanted to be in this thing. And for the first time ever, Frank Miller tries his hand at directing. It's been really wonderful for him to not only be a part of the process, but not just be a writer, but be considered a director and be able to give input. Can we switch sides on the stethoscope? I expected the worst, and I got the best. I loved it. I love directing. I had no idea what it would be like. I didn't know how much I'd love actors. It was essential to have Frank Miller on set every day because it's his baby, it's his world. He knows everything. He wrote all the dialogue, he created all the characters. You know, how can you do Sin City without Frank Miller? And I had Frank to go and talk to about character and why we were here and what was going on in the scene and about every little nuance. It was great to have Frank there. We could go and ask him, you know, this drawing, What's he doing here? Where is he coming from? When I go to work in Sin City, it was Frank Miller, co-directed by Robert Rodriguez, and then Quentin was guest directing the days that I was there, which was very fortunate on my behalf to have three such extraordinary directors that all fit so perfectly with each other. Dimension Films releases Sin City on April 1st, 2005. And while audiences are introduced to the gritty world of Basin City, Frank Miller is still hard at work on the comics he loves. It's called Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder, and it's going to feature a young Batman. Today, Frank Miller remains one of the greatest names in comics. His impact on the world of comics is undeniable, and his work will continue to inspire generations to come. Frank's 
comics are incredible and dark and twisted and just amazing. And I've never read any graphic novels that are as intense as his. He's his own little legend. Frank's work has had an amazing effect on the comic book industry. He is one of the few creators who comes into a medium and sets it on its ear and really makes it look at itself in a, in a different light. What goes on in his brain is something so crazy, beautiful, sexy, violent, cool, genius. I don't know that I'd compare anybody to Frank Miller. I mean, I think Frank is really in a category all of his own. One thing about entertainment, whether it's comic books or movies, is that you can't imagine the fate of the piece of work. I proceed with confidence, I think we all do, and hope that the audience will love it. I've had the experience for a lifetime.